Well, thank you for inviting me back again today. Um, so, I'm an infectious tropical disease specialist, and I see refugees in Canada. I've traveled to over 50 countries. I've done a lot of uh, development work, but I've spent probably most of the past 20 five years uh, researching in the Arctic. Try to explain that to my mother, a tropical disease specialist who spends all their time in the Arctic. Anyway, um, she's still trying to understand. Um, I could come up here and talk about the terrible statistics for Indigenous children, how they disproportionately suffer in every measurable category, um, vital statistics. But I've decided to tell you my personal story instead. And then I'll throw in a few editorial comments and a few statistics. Um, since my childhood, my career was supposed to be working with vulnerable populations in resource poor parts of the world. But it took a sharp turn in 1995 when I was asked to go to Iqaluit, Nunavut, for a six-week pediatric research rotation. What I saw shocked me. I witnessed the poor determinants of health, extreme poverty, overcrowding, inaccessibility to services that we all take for granted, and I felt many of those health issues were comparable to what we see in resource-poor parts of the world. However, this was in our own backyard. When I worked at the hospital that summer, I, exclusively, I saw almost exclusively young Inuit babies admitted for lower respiratory tract infections, LRTIs. We call it bronchiolitis. Um, we'll get my slides up in the next little while. Um, okay, great. Okay, oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure I would get them. All right, um, so, so I would see all these little babies with, you know, terrible lung infections, usually caused by a virus, and I started wondering, is this real? How come they're so sick? This seems disproportionate. So I started out adding up the numbers, and that was the beginning of 20 years of research in Indigenous populations. Um, in my first study, I found out that one-third of all the babies on Baffin Island were admitted to the hospital with the LRTI in the first year of life. But this rises to almost 50% if you are less than six months of age. And I've found out that Inuit babies get hospitalized at 30 to 60 times the Canadian average. The virus responsible for most of the admissions is something called RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. How many of you know about this or know about the story? How many of you have heard me talk about this before? Okay, so, yes, some of you. Okay, so these are the highest rates of admission for any demographic group in Canada. You know, why doesn't the general public know? We know about heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, et cetera. But when a third of the babies on Baffin Island end up in the hospital with a lung infection, this is the highest rate of any admission in any age group anywhere in the country. But very few people know about it, unless you've heard me talk about it. So we published papers which demonstrated that Inuit babies have the highest rates of RSV actually in the world. These rates are higher than Sub-Saharan Africa, India, or Asia. When these babies get admitted to the hospital, they have about a 13% chance of being put on life support, being medically air evacuated to a tertiary center, maybe Ottawa, Montreal, Edmonton, Winnipeg, across the country, they're separated from their families. Often they have prolonged hospitalizations in the intensive care unit, often have complications, and sometimes die. Our study in 2002 showed that one in 20 babies born on Baffin Island who was less than six months of age during the RSV season was put on, um, put on life support due to RSV. So if we think about that for a moment, one in 20 babies born in the RSV season in Ottawa, like just say the winter season, ending up in the hospital. You could fill up the TD, uh, TD place with babies that are intubated and put on life support, or fill up Rogers Stadium in Toronto. Why don't people know about this? In 2002, an antibody became available against RSV, but it's expensive, so it's restricted to the children at highest risk for, for um, um, RSV disease. And here we have a slide. So you've got one, all, some different populations. You've got the rate of admission. You've got something called the number needed to treat. So basically, if you have any kind of intervention, you want to target the population with the highest rate of admission. And you want to, uh, number needed to treat is how many people do you need to treat before you actually have an in, in, 
uh, you make an intervention. For example, it could be for diabetes or, or anything, cancer treatment. So the lower the number, the better. The highest rate of admission should be the one that's targeted. Uh, so in this group of people, which group should get whatever uh, intervention? It's not a trick question. It's, it's pretty basic. Anyone daring to answer that question? Yeah. F, okay. So F has a rate of 328 versus 46 versus 81, and the lowest number needs to treat. Oops, okay, how do I go? Okay, so what we've realized is that, you know, groups, uh, you know, the, the RSV vaccine that came out in 2002, it's, it's given to the highest risk groups. So A to E are babies with uh, prematurity or chronic lung disease or heart disease. And those are their rates, and that's the number needed to treat. The bottom part are Inuit babies. So everyone from uh, A to E, they all get the RSV antibody, but F doesn't. We have science, we have statistics. Does anyone see a discrepancy here? So, so we have uh, babies uh, that have the highest rate of RSV admission in the world. They have very severe disease. We have a vaccine preventable disease where the implementation of the RSV antibody would be cheaper than the cost of admission, but it's still not implemented. Oh yeah, I forgot, oh, this is one of my editorial comments. By the way, they happen to be Inuit. And I can tell you that that would never occur in any other population in Canada. And I stand before you as a witness of the discrimination that goes on with Indigenous peoples in Canada. And that the RSV story is only one example of the numerous examples of discrimination that occurs in our healthcare system. Whether it's diabetes, uh, cancer, anything else, this is just the tip of the iceberg. That's my first part, it's like three parts. So 20 years ago, I had heard some heartbreaking stories of a child being found uh, in the snow and in, in their diapers at minus 40 and the lack of social services in Nunavut, specifically in Inuit. After a long discussion with an Inuit elder, I happened to mention that I would be willing to adopt an Inuit child. Many years later, on December the 20th, 2004, I know that day, because that's when I was called by the Canadian Red Cross to go to the tsunami in Asia. Um, I received a phone call saying that there was an Inuit child uh, in a foster home that needed, needed to be adopted, or they were looking for a home. And that the elder happened to mention, Dr. Bio has said she would adopt an Inuit child. So I canceled my trip to Asia and flew up to Iqaluit to adopt my son. I said yes before I knew if he, if he was a he or she, or what age they were, I just said yes. Actually, I'd never even seen my son or a picture of him until they put him in my arms and said, this is your child. So I've been taking my son back to the north every two to three years so he could know about his identity and see his foster and biological families. And through my time in the Arctic, I saw that many Inuit communities live in substandard housing with severe overcrowding, and I have stayed in some of these homes. On our last trip, I took my 11-year-old son back to his home community, where I went to the grave of his 14-year-old brother who had committed suicide. This is another editorial comment. By the way, the rates of suicide are astronomically higher than the rest of Canada. I believe that Inuit children or Inuit youth have the highest rates of suicide in the world, and that often First Nations and Inuit families, sorry, First Nations and Inuit youth have packs to kill themselves, and they kill themselves together in epidemics. Going back to the story. My son realized that his family members had addictions. Again, editorial comment. The impact of colonization has long lasting impacts on some indigenous people and some communities. He realized that his brothers and sisters were malnourished. Again, editorial comment. In fact, they are stunted. By the way, 70% of preschool children in Nunavut have food insecurity. And the cost of food in, in the Arctic for many Inuit families is unaffordable. We have indigenous children starving in this country. The impact, the impact of colonization has had a direct impact on my son's mental health, where he suffers from depression. And now as a 13-year-old boy, he talks about suicide as if it's a norm or an option for him. 
As a non-Indigenous woman, the legacy of colonization has had a personal impact on my family as well. I have also been part of the First Nations Inuit Métis Committee of the Canadian Pediatric Society and have had the privilege to travel across the country to many, to numerous Indigenous communities, from Haida Gwaii to Nain, rural and urban. I've written a statement on behalf of the Canadian Pediatric Society for the injury prevention of Indigenous children uh, and youth in Canada. And through writing the statement, okay, uh, I realized that Indigenous children uh, at, die at three to four times the, the national average. And for the ones that have serious injury, most of them don't have access to rehab. And that many Indigenous homes don't have fire alarms or fire stations or smoke detectors or, or swimming lessons or personal, personal flotation devices or anything that we take for, for granted for, uh, for injury prevention. I've also written a paper on food security, hopefully it'll be published in the next little while, where again I say that Indigenous children are starving in this country. You know, we looked at the facts. This is not just me saying it. These are facts. It should be a national embarrassment. I have heard communities talk in despair about the opioid addictions and the loss of their youth. I've traveled to communities in Labrador and, and have heard about the despair about the epidemics of fetal alcohol syndrome. And I've also been to Haida Gwaii, which is among one of the healthiest communities I've seen because they have food security from the fish and marine animals, which is now threatened. I'm a pediatrician, researcher, mother, and I'm now a witness. Indigenous children in Canada do not have equitable access to the basic necessities of life compared to non-Indigenous children in Canada. We can only move forward as a society when the most vulnerable populations in our society have equity in the social determinants of health. Yeah, I'm going to put a plug in again for the conference because if you want to learn about Indigenous health solutions, there are many solutions if you start listening. But this is one of the things where you can hear more uh, from the voices of Indigenous people uh, who talk about uh, some of the challenges and some of the solutions over a three-day period in a conference, the Indigenous Health Conference, Walking Together. There are some more uh, pamphlets here. There are many so solutions, but if we as a society put in a real effort and truly believe that we can, this is important, that we need to move forward, that we can truly leave no people behind. Thank you.